from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom and priests, to serve our God and Father, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. We listen again to God's words to us in Mark chapter 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, these are are transition verses. They form a a literary bridge between, between two events. And it's not a passage that I probably wouldn't, I probably would have picked out for a sermon if the worship calendar that we followed hadn't picked them out for me. But once again, I discover that a passage that I've skimmed over thousands of times is just full of treasure in plain sight. They're transition verses, so it's helpful for us to know the the events on, on either side. On the before side, Jesus sends out the 12 apostles on their first mission trip in the northern part of Israel. We, we heard about this last Sunday. They went out two by two and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and healed many sick people. So now they, they come back to Jesus and report all that they did and, and taught. And then a big chunk of the people that, that they had preached to follow along with them. The, the apostles had helped them, but these people still needed more help. At the same time, the the disciples were were tired, and they needed needed food and and rest and some alone time. So Jesus said to them, "Come, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. The crowds could wait. So Jesus and his disciples, they get into this boat for a getaway. On the after side of these verses is the well-known feeding of the 5,000. And 5,000, that, that gives us maybe a glimpse as to how many, how many lives the apostles had touched on their mission trip. These people who had followed them from the villages back to Jesus, they see the boat going over to the other side, and they race around, and they beat them to the dock. So the same people that Jesus and his disciples were aiming to get away from, they're welcoming them when they get out of the boat. And this is my favorite part. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he didn't get back in the boat and try to outsail them. He didn't bark at them to go home. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus and his disciples, they, they needed food and rest and alone time. But for now, those things could wait. For now, these people who needed a shepherd, they were the number one priority. So Jesus gets to work, and he, began, he begins to teach them many things. If we just skim through them, we see transition verses. Mark closes out the apostles' first mission trip, and he sets the stage for the feeding of the 5,000. But if we just slow down and, and drink in these, these verses, in the first paragraph, we, we drink it in, and we see an example of how Jesus deals with us as we serve him. And then if we stay going slow and drink in the second paragraph, we see an example of how Jesus deals with us when we need to be served by him. So let's just take a a few minutes and, and drink in how these two paragraphs relate to us.
for the apostles. It was a, a mission trip to the villages in the northern part of Israel. But there are, are all kinds of service to Jesus that will leave the Christian exhausted. The man, the man he goes to work and, 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 and he works like a horse to provide for his family, but then he comes back home and, and he hides his exhaustion so that he can still treat his wife like a queen. And then, and then the wife... She's got kids nipping at her heels from sunrise until the time they go to bed and beyond a few times during the night, but she still musters the energy to be, to be a wife to her husband. You think about the, the unassuming Christian who, who's always a rock for her friends to lean on, always there, always strong. And there are, are all kinds of other ways that Christians can selflessly give and give and give some more. But if giving is all you're doing, you're eventually going to run out of stuff to give. Isn't that what exhausted means? It means that you're empty. So isn't that refreshing to see that Jesus realizes that we're not physical and emotional robots? He knows that when we love people and show it, that we're giving away pieces of ourselves and we need, we need replenishment. His invitation to his disciples extends to us. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Breaks are good. Jesus encourages them he puts his disciples into a boat and they sail away. And I want to encourage you too to, to make time for breaks and to write them into your calendar without any kind of guilt. Because it's, be, it's not to be selfish. It's because you, you can't draw water from a dry well. We need to keep on filling ourselves up so that we can keep on giving out. But there's two warnings that need to come along with that. We need two warnings, I think, because Jesus' little trip with his disciples, it was different from, from, I guess, conventional views of vacation in at least two ways. First of all, Jesus and his disciples didn't work hard so that they could take a boat trip. They took a boat trip so that they could keep on working hard. If we consider our breaks and vacations to be the, the goal of our work, then we have things precisely backwards. We don't work hard so that we can relax. We relax so that we can keep on working hard. Think about, think about the guy who's running a marathon. He's, he's about halfway through the race, and, and surprise, he's exhausted. So he slows down, walks for a mile. He didn't run the first 14 miles so that he could walk a mile. He took the breather so that he could finish the race. The goal of the Christian life, it's not the resting part. The goal is the working part. We rest so that we can keep on working. Then the second way in which Jesus' little getaway with his disciples was, was different from conventional views of, of vacation. Jesus didn't send them off alone. Two words in, in that invitation that are important. He says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Jesus is with them in the boat, and it's, and it's safe to assume what Jesus was doing in the boat. He was talking to them. He was teaching them. He was filling them up so that they could keep on giving. I find it I ironic that the, the most widely used um, methods for rest and relaxation in our society, they're, they're methods that attempt to distance us from reality. So some examples, uh, man comes home from work and he's, in, he's entirely exhausted. So what does he do? He parks himself in a hypnotic state in front of the television. Meanwhile, his wife, who he is ignoring, 
is trying to rest vicariously through her friend's Facebook posts. Some people try meditation. They try meditation to, to push the things out of their minds that they don't have the strength to face. Many more people just try to numb themselves to reality through alcohol. And television and, and Facebook and, and wine, they can all play a proper role in the life of the Christian, but they also can easily be abused. None of those things will ever give us the strength and the desire to love and to forgive and, and to give. None of those things will ever work because, because we don't get that strength by running away from reality or, or by numbing ourselves to it. Rejuvenation comes from embracing reality. So imagine, imagine Jesus saying it just to you. Come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. And then turn off the television. Set down your phone. And grab your Bible and go to your quiet place and listen to Jesus talk to you just like he talked to his exhausted disciples. You're not too busy to listen. And he's not too busy to refresh you with reality. Open up your Bible, and he'll show you real people with real problems, just like you. He'll show you a woman whose daughter was suffering terribly, and she knew where to go. She went to Jesus, and, and, and she pleads with Jesus to make her daughter better, and Jesus gives her every indication that he's not paying any attention to her. Imagine her exhaustion. But it turns out the whole time Jesus was listening to her and he made her daughter better when the time was right. Open up your Bible and, and Jesus is going to introduce you to a woman named Martha. A woman who served and served and served and drove herself to bitterness toward everyone who wasn't working as hard as she was. But Jesus was gentle with her and he invited her to put down her pots and pans and listen to him because that's where the strength and the joy to serve come from. You go to your quiet place and you take Jesus with you and he'll show you so many people just like you. People who struggle with doubt, with guilt, with self-righteousness, with bitterness, with broken families, with unhealthy relationships. People just like you so that you can look past what you feel and embrace the reality of what Jesus does for you, of how he deals with you with compassion and love and gentleness and forgiveness. That's how he replenishes you and fills you up with love and strength. And that love and, the st and strength, they overflow from you onto the people that you serve. Those, those alone times with, with Jesus, they're often much shorter than we wish they were. The, the apostles' quiet time with Jesus, it was basically over at the time it started. But it's enough. God has a way of showing us how strong he can make us. And God also has a knack for giving us relief when he knows that we need it. So there's some obvious tension in these verses. On the one hand, you have Jesus' apostles who are tired and need rest. On the other hand, you have 5,000 people plus women and children who need to be, who need to be served. Demand is, is, is way outweighing the supply. Like Jesus says in another place, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And, and I think that we can identify with that when we feel like, like we're the shepherd and we have, have way too many sheep that are looking to us for strength and help and we just don't have enough to go around. I think we can also identify with that when we feel more like the sheep. 
when we need help and strength, and, and we don't see anybody that we can lean on. So look at what Jesus did. Pay close attention to what Jesus did when the harvest was plentiful and the workers were exhausted. Everybody in this scene needs him. But he doesn't climb back into the boat and try to sail away. He doesn't bark at them to go home. He has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Food and rest and alone time. Jesus needed those things too, but those things could wait. So he gets to work. Jesus doesn't let trivial things like a lack of resources stand in his way of loving people. He always has more than enough to give us, even when we have no idea where he's going to get it. The ultimate proof that Jesus always has more than enough to give us, even when we have no idea where he's going to get it. Look past the feeding of the 5,000 that we'll hear next Sunday. Look at his death. He's beaten down so much before he's crucified that he collapses under the weight of his own cross. But what amazes me, it's not that eventually they get Jesus to the place where they can hang him up. What amazes me is that Jesus didn't tap into his unlimited resources and come down. He stays, and he, and he pays the price of our laziness and selfishness and bitterness and self-medicating. He stays there, and on account of that, he'll never leave us. Whether you're like the shepherd who feels like the sheep need so much more than, than, than you can give them, or whether you're more like the sheep who, who needs a shepherd to lean on, Jesus will always supply your need, even when you have no idea how he's going to do it. And he'll tell you that. He'll show you that. Every time you listen to his invitation, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. And he'll refresh you with reality. Amen.